two minutes from each speaker. First of all, just some opening statements, and then we'll go into questions from the floor. I will try not to say too much because I think I'd, we'd much rather hear from you, uh, but I'll moderate questions a, as we go. So, Atia, would you like to start, please? Yes. Assalamu alaikum, everyone. And uh, I just want to start off by really thanking Cambridge for organizing this because you know, I was thinking that, uh, oh my God, I'm going to have to take the morning off and, you know, we're all super busy and, and I was thinking how to juggle things, but being here has honestly been so refreshing because after two years of COVID, uh, coming together with a fraternity that has so many common experiences has, has really been sort of motivating and, um, and has been sort of uh, encouraging to know that we were all in this together and, and we're going to come out of this together, um, stronger and with a lot of learning. Um, but, but I think that we should, particularly here in Pakistan, give ourselves uh, an extra pat on the back. Because as we were sort of grappling with COVID, schools on and off, we were also given the additional, I'm going to try and be very politically correct, um, the additional um, responsibility of integrating the single national curriculum. And, and honestly, that really wasn't needed. But we were still coming to terms with everything involved with online learning, exams, um, you know, uh, schools going on, schools going off. And then suddenly we had this entire new curriculum that the government itself was figuring out. Um, and, and we had to sort of uh, launch it in, in schools and, and we had to launch it without textbooks. So I think that this uh, room here should give themselves an extra pat on the back and a round of applause for managing it with aplomb and for managing it without letting our children suffer. And that is the responsibility that we carry with us as educationists. And I think the burden of that responsibility became all too acute with the onset of COVID and with the onset of school closures. And I think that all of us rose to that responsibility and challenge. Um, and, and I think that we did a fairly good job given the, the, the results that we saw at least out of Pakistan in the CIEs. I, I think if that's any indicator. So, so I just want to conclude by saying that, that uh, you know, that um, really well done, everybody. But, but let's not forget that we are sitting in a very privileged fraternity here. We are uh, representing uh, the, the very privileged of Pakistan. And it is our responsibility, while our responsibility is to our own learners, we must not forget our responsibility to the millions of Pakistani children who for two years had virtually zero education. They had no access to any form of online learning, any learning at all. The, the women in rural areas used to say that, you know, we're so sick of our children being out of school. They're always in the streets, getting into fights. And, and the kind of uh, learning losses that this country outside of our sort of privileged classes face, I think that that should always be part of us. And, and in whatever way we can, we must play our part um, and, and do what we can to also remember that, um, that class that is not represented here. Thank you. you. Atiya, thank you. And I think Atiya said most of what I wanted to say in my introduction, but the part about the SNC and obviously we'll, I'll also endeavor to be politically correct, but it came at a time where we needed a lot of uh, lateral breadth. So I felt that a lot of that was taken and we were we just prioritized certain curricula in the first year of the pandemic. We would kind of rerouted a lot of pedagogy, methodology and curriculum. In order to do it all over again in the second year was a next Netflix season of horror too, I think. And we did that. We did all of that very well. But a lot of good work came out of the pandemic. I think we've regrouped. We've become more conscious of what the future will hold. We've become much more conscious of the digital revolution that we're living in. And we've become much more conscious of the you know, job readiness that it will involve and the uh, level of uh, preparation 
that we will need for our students. For instance, our year one students currently will um, enter the job market in the year 2040. So for me and for a lot of us at Lahore Grammar School, we've been asking us the, ourselves these questions that are we preparing them effectively for these challenges? So yes, um, and obviously, just like Atiya said, a lot of good work has gone in. And we should really congratulate ourselves on what we've been able to achieve, which has been phenomenal. So um, this collective conversation is very crucial, and I'm really happy to be here. Thank you. Aisha, thank you. Uh, colleagues, before I pass over to Dr. Mushtaq, um, we have one empty chair, and that's we please accept our sincere apologies. Um, yes, if I, I would, you'd like to come to the uh, to the podium, please. I'm so sorry. If that is um, Basrai is um, principal of Dawood uh, Public School, so please accept our apologies for that. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Cambridge, and uh, a very good afternoon to all the colleagues here. I thought Cambridge is apolitical an organization, but every time a Cambridge Schools Conference is hosted or held, this government is always at the crossroad of change in Pakistan <laughs> on the lighter side. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, my fellow colleagues and fellow educators and academics and school leaders and practitioners, this has been the biggest closure of teaching and learning post the Second World War. 1.6 billion learners were out of school. Humanity and mankind has never seen such a closure of teaching, learning, and society. And I always say that for schooling and education systems to evolve, and coming to the question that has the pandemic impacted or changed schooling forever, you must understand one thing, that the only thing that shall remain certain in the future is called uncertainty. And the only thing that shall be considered as a constant shall be called change itself within your classrooms and teaching and learning pedagogies. If you are to be able to evolve yourself, both as a teacher, a pedagogue, as a practitioner, as, as a school, you must have the ability to unlearn, learn, and relearn. Now coming to the topic and the theme that has it impacted schooling. In fact, it has impacted the scope of schooling. It has given us an opportunity to revisit, rediscover, and reshape the scope of schooling. Schooling is a different concept as compared to teaching and learning provision, as is curriculum a different concept to syllabus. Pedagogy is different to andragogy. So it's very important for you to understand when we say that it has impacted the scope of a schooling, the question is that you must revisit yourself. Is school an extension of home or is home an extension of school? The moment you start thinking about it, you will realize that pandemic has given an alternative opportunity. It has been able to replace exams with empathy. It has been able to replace grounds, grades with grounds. It has been able to replace curriculum with compassion. We have always been hearing, and especially with all these universities and platforms, that technology shall replace the teacher in 21st century. Quarter of the 21st century is gone. I would like to demyst demystify this myth or rhetoric. Technology shall never replace the teacher. The teachers, those who do not use technology, yes. shall be replaced by the ones. Yes. Please listen this carefully. Technology shall never replace the teacher. Teachers, those who do not use technologies, shall be replaced by the ones, those who do use technology. So the impact of digital platform, ed tech, and remaining platforms shall remain there. Always remember that we have had a challenge with the access, equity, and connectivity. When we talk about equity, there's also an equity in teaching and learning. Access has been a challenge. Not all families had the access or the tools, and connectivity is clearly privileged, like my fellow colleague said. In the past, we were used to, Lee, we were used to a concept called curriculum. 
gone are the days of curriculum with the curriculum it is becoming curriculum for the society gone are the days my colleague refer referred to single national curriculum it was the single national confusion i am a member of the national curriculum council and i say it publicly that was the biggest educational mistake that we made and inshallah we will shall all revert to the new no to the normal and to back again <laughs> digital inclusion 10 years our teachers have been doing the journey from uh, from uh, email to where you stand today you went through microsoft trainings you went through digital inclusion you went to digital literacy there's a whole generation of googles and facebooks and so on and so forth but the, what we wanted to achieve as school communities over the last 10 years public or private both do not underestimate semi urban and peri urban communities what we were wanted to achieve over the last 10 years we achieved over the last 10 weeks during covid in terms of digital inclusion ict integration and digital literacy pakistan ki teachers they are not heroes they are sheroes she version of heroes they had done such a uh, fantastic job with online digital teaching and learning provision that it created a new version of the social contract which was based on trust authenticity and visibility minus the children at an early school level which suffered at by at large our men and women they did very well in the end i have always said that family is the best classroom this pandemic has given us an opportunity to rediscover who we are the social contract humanity society when children are at home they have been able to discover physics through their toys chemistry through the kitchen biology in the garden artificial intelligence from their laptops and ipads and arts through their paint brushes so pandemic has taught us its own lessons as we move forward cambridge we must also must reflect on the curriculum on the concept of examinations and mental health and well being and inclusivity and equity should be at the heart of everything that we do thank you it hasn't felt sweeter than it did today to be forgotten so i just want to i want to draw your attention to the fact that the children perhaps also felt forgotten right what can you say to a gathering of such talent our esteemed my fellow esteemed colleagues this room is full of experience talent and future sort of intentions of taking this pandemic uh, experiences from it further in developing change readiness in your schools so i thought of what i'm going to say but the only thing that came to my mind was so many questions so i think i'm just going to ask some rhetorical questions and the answers have been left to you so did we truly break away from barriers and tried new how eager were we to make make it back to normal pre covid era what will stay what will not what do the students say and thank you very much for that research what do the students say did we use our third arm the parental community or did we continue to keep it neglected did we mute the student voice or did we allow them to articulate what was going well in pre covid era was a question that we need to ask because when we judge students of whether we did better or we did poorly during covid we all went through it yes we all went through it but are we better off are we worse off what was it what went well even better if right www.ebi we all use it feedback is one element that was missing 
in COVID-based teaching. And I think, yes, we've had great O-level results, uh, not so good A-level results. So um, I think it is the feedback and we need to really reconsider. It was perhaps organic in pre-COVID era. Perhaps we need to break down that successful element and really think what was it in the feedback that we missed during COVID? Was muting students really an ideal scenario or was it the need of the teacher because she too was struggling with the whole? So she wanted silence on the other end so she could get her work done and move on. So hence, uh, my colleagues, uh, there are many questions and many interpretations. And I think you are the best judge to see the context that you work in. I do belong to a school that has both the sides, the privileged and the underprivileged. We at Daoud have an underprivileged program where 200 students are given free education. And we did see the difference in the digital equity. And I think gone are the days when we say schools of underprivilege exist on the other side of the wall. They need to exist inside our schools. Definitely. That's right, thank you. Uh, colleagues, before I open up to the floor, I have one question for the panel, which I, I appreciate your reflections on. Um, I mentioned earlier about sharing success criteria with students such that they could plan towards success. One of the observations we've made at Cambridge is that the visibility on learning from parents has increased. They're aware of success criteria, what would success look like in a task? And I just wonder, please, it'd be great to hear from you whether you've seen that, first of all, and then if you want to build on that, you talked about the third arm, whether you want to build on that in this emerging time now. So, Hathia, if you want to go. Um, thank you, Lee. That's, uh, that's a very interesting question. And it made me think of um, the fact that the feedback we got from teachers across the board was that they felt that they were under a microscope uh, because for the first time, the parent was in the classroom. And, and the parents were sort of sitting, perhaps not in front of the camera, but certainly right next to the child. So there was a lot more feedback coming in. And yes, you're absolutely right. The parents were aware of all the tasks assigned to the children, and therefore they absolutely knew the success criteria. Now, this, this, this was very helpful, but this also created a division because uh, we had a very, very large um, number of parents who worked and who were not able to supervise uh, the online learning of their children. And then we saw those children um, suffer setbacks because of this lack of supervision and where um, you had parents who were able to uh, supervise their children to um, understand what the success criteria of the tasks assigned etc was those children were able to um, do better because they had um, the help that they would otherwise lack in a classroom so um, so it's a double-edged sword and, and something that very early on our teachers became cognizant of and then devised various strategies to counterbalance this sort of division that we saw was going on where uh, children with parental supervision were uh, performing better and responding better um, than those uh, who lacked that. Um, shall I? Supervision is key, like my colleague, she mentioned, <clears throat> but also like you talked about parents, they had visibility now. <clears throat> they have visibility. Uh, schooling in Pakistan in the private sector has been a very unique and uh, it, it has been a very traditional concept. Especially I say that in our society, by at large, parents, after having a baby, the father franchises the child to the mother. And then he expects that she shall look after the child. During the pandemic, for the first time, I saw the fathers waking up in the morning and seeing that teacher, the Pakistani teacher, the Pakistani Aisha, the Pakistani Amina, the Pakistani Sana, making that effort online. That visibility has given a lot of assurance to the key financial decision maker in the household. 
I have seen a very positive impact of pandemic in terms of the family contract because usually the child was on a franchise, the so fathers have taken the franchise back now, which is also good. Parents play a key role. And I think as teachers, sometimes we forget that learning doesn't begin the minute the child enters the school and ends when he or she leaves it. A baby is born and learning begins from the moment uh, that child's eyes open up. The baby is absorbing everything in the environment. Hence, parents are a very, very critical arm. You need to provide them a platform to speak. Um, so at school, at the out public school, we uh, are very data driven. We take feedback from them very regularly. We ask them uh, what they would like. The last uh, feedback form that we asked parents to fill was, what would you want to continue? And the response was that we would like the digital repository. Content. They really like the digital repository. They like the collaboration and the communication element of the digital platform. So it very clearly told us what we need to do in future. So hence, with the parents, we need to have very clearly defined moments where they come into school, have a cup of coffee, or a very formalized system of perhaps drawing data from them. Uh, I am not. Uh, I don't propose that the parents should sit outside while the child's class is going on because there's an inbuilt accountability. An accountability which often in the pre-pandemic time was forgotten that as teachers, as school leaders, the parent loans the child to us. Right? Uh, basically, they are loaned to us in good faith. And I think that accountability was really an eye-opener. Yeah. Aisha, would you like to? Yeah, I definitely felt at the junior school where the children, uh, they thrive under the care of a very uh, observing eye of the staff. I felt the mother's and the father's perspective would have, was a good substitute for that observation where it helped us to build data that could help us improve um, the, the learning outcomes for the children. So at the junior school level, yes, definitely the parents um, involvement in and the uh, the fact that they were able to view what we were doing was a definitely a positive step and even at the senior school level a lot of uh, our parents they were previously really not too aware of the good job that maybe the a level teachers or the depth of the curriculum or the intensity of the challenge of the exam so i felt that a lot of good feedback came from there yes uh, so just briefly since the chief executive is sitting here you know, I'm glad that Cambridge is no more an exam organization. Yeah. It is an education organization. When we talk about holistic, pluralistic, 21st and a half century education, then we must realize that the whole concept of the pedagogical construct should be embedded in the education provision. During the pandemic, you gave schools the opportunity to predict the grades. That is where the role and the influence of teachers, program coordinators, and school leadership became more validating, assured, and authentic. It gave schools the opportunity to be able to genuinely shape the portfolio, profile, and the trajectory of the student as opposed to some of the trends that you had in the past. So I would expect that this culture and tradition should continue where schools should be treated as partners, as a community, not just as centers for providing exams. Thank you. Yeah, and, and we'll have an opportunity to discuss that more later, actually. So thank you, Fizzle. Um, OK, I've got a question for you guys. Um, Parent-teacher meetings were all done online. How many of you will continue to keep them online in the future? Just a show of hands, or are you going to come back? There's a no there. Thank you. A yes. No's. OK, maybe's. Okay. It's a mixed bag. Yeah. yeah. It'd be interesting, won't it? Yeah. Sort of hybrid, perhaps. Absolutely. Okay, let's let's go to questions from the floor, from the for the panel, please. We have please, a roving. Before the questions, can I just please, add a comment? Please go ahead, Waishi. When we were just analyzing and raising our placards for Tabinda, uh, the survey that you guys did, I think for the 
most challenging element that I felt as a school leader, and I think this will resonate with most of you here, was the over accessibility. I think we all we had cabin fever. We were performing against the context of a very I mean, there was grief and loss, and we were expected to be available 24/7. I felt that. That was the biggest challenge that our community of leaders and teachers felt. I mean, there was little, there was oftentimes we felt little respect for our private time, of which there was hardly any. So I think we're all fatigued, and that was the biggest challenge, and that needs to be appreciated and dealt with. When I mean, Athiya spoke beautifully about, uh, you know, the uh, element of the mental stress the children faced. But I think a very organized program about the mental stresses that the staff faced also needs to be in place I think in the our term networks. Momina used, yeah, um, so frontline workers was very yeah, apt. yeah, it was uh, even uh, sorry, I mean school leaders and you know even people like the IT support staff. I think they are really the unsung heroes of our schools yeah. because the way they really bridge the gaps for us that needs to be appreciated and acknowledged. Yeah, thank, thank you, guys. Atiyah, you wanted to add something? No, no, I, I just uh, said that the term Momina used, frontline workers, it was very apt because I think after uh, the medical frontline workers, it was the education sector that, like she said, was on call 24 7. Yes. Thank you. Thank you, colleagues. Um, so, questions from the floor, please. Who has a question or even a comment? you know, to add to what's been said. <laughs> Nadine, you should ask the question. <laughs> Are you encouraging your honor? <laughs> so there is a, a colleague with his hand up here. Yes, sir. Hello, my name is Amar Enver, and I'm from First Step School of Arts and Sciences, Faisalabad. Uh, you talked about increased supervision and how it is a positive thing. I agree to a certain extent, but this is a comment. Don't you think that increased supervision from parents actually meant more anxiety for the students? Because their success criteria is very mechanical. Their success criteria is based on straight A's and A stars. So don't you think it actually added the anxiety to the students? And also when we talk about teachers being responsive and school leaders being responsive 24 by 7. So I'm sure all of you can say that we had to respond to more parents eventually. Yeah. I'd like to um, have a go at that. I think that um, in many ways, online learning mimicked actual um, you know, classroom learning. And wherever the parents are the sort of helicopter variety that put that kind of pressure on their children, um, you see anxiety um, regardless of online or physical. So I think the point to be made is that those parents who have a tendency of being sort of overly anxious about their children's uh, learning uh, will lead to that um, increased anxiety, whether it's online or whether it's in the classroom. And, and the sort of parents who are more balanced in their approach will play a supportive role and will never lead to increased anxiety in the parents. That, that's, that's what I think. Uh, yes, please. Um, to add on to, it's just a continuing question actually from this issue of increased uh, visibility to parents. Um, given our legal context, where there are certain types of speech that is forbidden, um, and when we're teaching O-level courses, where critical thinking and asking questions about topics that are perhaps not to be discussed, uh, given the legal context, um, how do you feel that has played into the ability of teachers to carry out learning activities freely, um, given the fact that there is now a video camera on them. Thank you. Who would like to address that? I'm not so sure whether the teachers actively do engage in contradicting the society. I think our teachers are very savvy about the environment we work in. Now, having said that, yes, misinterpretations, even our children are very, right? When you're teaching Islamiyat in English, I think it is one of the most difficult subjects to teach. Finding a teacher of Islamiyat to teach in English is, a, I've really struggled with that as well, okay? 
having observed those classes, I think the art of navigating yourself through sticky points is something that a lot of teachers had already achieved in the classroom because our children also have throbbing minds. And children in later adolescence always revert back to their family thinking. And I think that plays out in your normal classroom anyways. Don't you agree? I'm throwing the question back to you now. Yeah. Or literature. There, there is a microphone just behind you. Hmm. Thank, you. Thank you. Thank you. Where students are expected, in fact, to engage in discussion. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm not simply talking about issues that regarding religion, but where um, there are laws about questioning governance decisions. There are laws increasingly the Electronic Crimes Act, for example, all of these things. And the reason I bring them up is because they are a very real factor of our external circumstances. And I mean, as a teacher, I know that I have students who have asked me, Miss, can you please turn the video camera off for this conversation? I have specifically had those requests from students. Mm -hmm. So what, the, what happens? when all the students are online and you don't have that luxury of turning off the electronic and surveillance. The, and the lesson is recorded. Yeah. Don't yes. forget, the, the most uh, online lessons are now recorded. Yes. Ma'am, uh, the three things, knowledge, skills, and values. And in any culture and society, you always need to be culturally and socially inclusive. So cultural embeddedness and uh, social mindedness and uh, limitations of our social contract, they're always there. We do question and talk about critical thinking. Oh, you may focus on inquiry, you may focus on curiosity, you may focus on cognitive abilities, but in a country like Pakistan, yes, there are certain limitations. And the moment we try to cross that line or bridge, and there is an element of going beyond. So it is a fact and it also exists in other parts of the world, including Europe, America, and Canada. Debate has to be moderated. It should be culturally, socially, morally, and in terms of faith group aligned, in my opinion. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, there is a question from a gentleman at the back there. Mine is not oh, a question, okay. but it's a statement. Please. Uh, as mentioned by Atiya, that the frontline force, uh, forces, our teachers, our school leaders, our practitioners, the problems where they are facing, they face during that time. And after that, the biggest issue, the biggest challenge we are facing is to cover the ga learning gaps. Mm. Because many of our students were unable to attend because of the lack of gadgets or because of the lack of the supervision, or maybe many students left school because of the losses of their uh, parents job and they rejoin us so the biggest challenge nowadays after that we what we are facing is to cover their learning gaps yeah. so we are though we are trying our level best but we need to cater while keeping the examination point of view in mind for those students who miss those uh, lessons or maybe the syllabus part yeah, I think that's an important point. And we will come back to that, I'm sure, this afternoon, actually, when we look at um, tertiary education and the implications for that. Um, there, there was a gentleman at the back there. Could I come to you in, sure. in a moment, madam? And, and then, um, so we'll have the gentleman at the back first, and then we'll come to, to you. Thank you. Hello, everyone. I am Ali uh, from International School of Horror, uh, the director and the CEO of the company, a new talk in the town. Uh, so... <clears throat> I have to ask a question from Mr. Faisal Mushtaq that uh, you talk about single national curriculum, you know, and uh, like I'm also the member of uh, UHS, the, uh, the executive member committee, which deals with the MDCAT programs and stuff. And, uh, you know, recently when we saw that in 2017, we changed the syllabus uh, for the MDCAT examinations where we went on with a collaboration of the syllabus of A-level and FSE because earlier it was only FSE. Then a new talk came out, it was, uh, it was regarding single national curriculum. Now, when we talk about SNC, so we've seen, I mean, a massive change 
in the curriculum. Uh, what we used to teach, what the teachers used to teach. But now, I think it's moving up, it's scaling up, it's going to middle school. So I have a question to ask from Mr. Faisal Mushtaq and Mr. Lee that uh, if we bring single national curriculum to the middle school, what impact will it have on O-levels? Um, thank you, Ali. <laughs> Everyone knows you. Yeah. And uh, <laughs> we all know you. Even we live next to the Prime Minister house, we also know you. Uh, the, you see, single national curriculum, they have come a long way. Um, they have been members uh, from other leading schools in the private sector. Beacon House has also been on the committee. The new uh, director of the SNC, Dr. Mariam Chuktai, actually, to be honest, she's a very progressive uh, academic. And she's pluralistic and she is listening. And, um, and I think the debate has been moderated. In the beginning, it was a political rhetoric. So it was part of the manifesto and it was the easiest thing to do though there were four other points of the manifesto. So now, you know, there is more rationality and uh, there is more reason and uh, it is going to adjust to its new normal. And of course, uh, let's see how things they do develop. But in terms of the child's ability to be prepared for Cambridge and O-levels as well, if there, is, if there are any gaps, they have told us, the single national curriculum people have told us, we are not here, we are not against IBs and Cambridge or... American high schools, it is you can do your own bridging curriculum, you can come up with your own pathways, you can come up with your own hybrid curriculum, you can do the patchwork, you can do the bridge work, you can do what you want to do. I don't want to comment about it, you know, it's, you know the political situation in the country, so give some time, inshallah. So um, the other thing is that, uh, sorry, the other, thing, uh, the, the other thing that we've been talking about is, yes, the curriculums, um, the school curriculums versus syllabus. Curriculum document versus syllabus, they're two different things. Abhi, gone are the days for such fat books, you know. Knowledge has to be delivered in an abstract way. It has to be topped up with activity, with technology, with assignment, with collaboration. So, you see, like, exams is a different concept. Assessments is a different concept. Assignments is different collaboration. So, I think the focus would be on less is more as we proceed forward, in my opinion. There would be less, but there would be more engagement, more topic and more discussion. And children, they are disrupted because of the screen times and how the new normal is. And no one has the time or rather the visibility to listen to 40 minutes of jazz. So the teachers also have to be very prepared. Are we gone other days that I've done double masters or MPhil in psychology or anthropology or English literature? If you are not prepared for what you are teaching, the first 15 minutes, that's all what it matters. This is that no one wants to listen to anyone apart from the Prime Minister. Thank you. <laughs> I should, I want yeah, to respond. I would like to reiterate what Faisal just said that in our recent talks with Dr. Mariam Chuktai, she did emphasize the fact that the middle school curriculum would be a minimum standard and not the maximum mm -hmm. standard as we were previously told to believe. So there is hope in that and I think we, all of us sitting here, we have enormous outreach. It is an issue that concerns all of us and we must use this clout and outreach to address this issue with the government or with the authorities that are handling the SNC. Mm. But there is hope. I think we should be able to uh, make a good deal out of it. I, I just like to add that um, in, in again in sort of endorsement of what uh, Faisal Saab said that um, everything about the SNC isn't bad. Um, in fact, a lot of the government school and sort of these NGO school teachers that I've spoken to feel that it's a huge improvement on whatever textbooks, curriculum, etc. they were teaching before. So while in uh, private schools we may feel that it sort of, um, you know, tried to uh, stifle us, uh, we must give credit where due. Yes. And, and I hope that, uh, you know, whatever the future political climate of the country is, that they retain some of the improvements and the good things about the SNC going forward for the uh, larger good of all the schools in Pakistan, not just the private schools. Yeah. Ali, um, you asked me a question as well. I'm afraid I don't know the answer to that yet. <laughs> But I don't know you, but I expect I have to know you. So I will sort of get to know you after this. It's important. 
Um, I, I'm, yeah, sorry, no, I have a question later. You finish. Okay, um, I, I'm, well, Aisha, I was just going to draw this session to a close, but if you want to make a final just statement. Just a quick question from Christine and Lee. Are we looking at pos the possibility of uh, an online exam at Cambridge, maybe, because all this work that we put in, unless it's the culmination point is some version of an online exam at O and A levels, it's really going to go to waste. So I'd like to hear more about that from you at some point. Sure. Yeah. Shall I give a quick response? Okay. So um, absolutely. Um, we are developing, we have a what we're calling a digital high stakes assessment um, sort of program fully on, um, on board now. Um, we're looking at it in three horizons. The first will be a sort of what we're calling essentially a lift and shift. So things that you would typically do on paper, we're going to move that into a digital piece. And the first um, evidence of that you will see at the end of the year through a mock service that we're releasing. Um, thereafter, we're looking at Horizon 2, which is very much about new constructs that we're going to be assessing. Um, so we've mentioned, I've mentioned with colleagues earlier about oracy. We're looking at data handling. We're looking at collaboration in the sciences and things like that. Um, this will be our um, a digital approach. And and really building on um, our resilience uh, alter alternative at the moment, which is the portfolio of evidence, you'll see we're building on that essentially for submission of, of, of evidence of learning, understanding, attainment um, digitally. Um, and with Horizon 3, which is very much sort of looking at uh, what AI can tell us in the future, both in terms of um, understanding evidence of learning, but also sort of new ways, new constructs. And again, um, that's very much in the future, but that's coming to... So we are responding, um, and you will see something very soon on that. Um, I'd like to apologize to my colleague um, over there. I'm so sorry, we have run out of time. But um, again, perhaps if you want to bring it back later on, we've got another panel session this, this afternoon. Sure. So, so thank you for your patience. Colleagues, I'd like to um, draw this session to a close now. Um, please give a round of applause to your panel. Thank you. And may I please request you to remain there? And I would request Christine to please hand over the small bouquets from Cambridge. Lee, you please join Christine. <laughs> so, Atia, since she's next to you first, yeah. Aisha. And last but not least, Ifat. Thank you. And if you, we can have a group photograph with all the panelists, moderator with Christine, please. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, panelists. Thank you, Lee, for a very insightful panel discussion. Thank you.